Hi, today I want to talk about um, passive play um, and what happens when you play too passively. Um, now I know that sounds real generic, but just bear with me. This game is um, from the All-Russian Chess Tournament in St. Petersburg, 1909. With the white pieces is a player named Nikolay Semen Semenovich. Tereshenko and the black player is a young Alexander um, Alakine who was about let's see he was born in 1892 so he was about 17 16 or 17 years old at the time depending on the uh, month okay so this game uh, started out um, Tereshenko played d4 and Alakine plays the provocative move e6. Now, at this point in um, Alakine's career, he was playing the French defense. And um, so after e4, he would play e6. And um, some players, um, in the attempt to avoid preparation, will play e6 against anything, hoping to um, obtain similar structures. So here we see Alakine just... Um, trying to provoke his opponent to play e4 but most players that are d4 players they want to keep the um, game in that realm so they play c4 as Tereshenko did here now what's interesting is that um, you can also play f5 here going into the Dutch you can play knight f6 there's um, a lot of transpositional uh, possibilities here <coughs> Alakon plays a move C5, and um, this move is uh, just as, um, you know, legitimate as the uh, rest of the moves. And now, at this point, I feel that White's only real chance at an advantage is to play D5 going into um, a Bononi-type formation. So, D5, and now here is another interesting move. Um, by Alakine is he um, plays move e5 right so he's played e6 and now he chooses to bypass the pawn and play e5 thus um, completely closing the position and this uh, formation after knight c3 and d6 is known as the check Benoni um, and some might know it as the Schmid Benoni, named after Grandmaster Lothar Schmid. Nevertheless, the features um, of these completely blocked positions um, merit that the play is going to transfer to the flanks immediately. Uh, you're in, in other words, uh, White's play is either going to be on the queen side or the king side and the same with black there's going to be very little play in the center as the center is pretty much defined at this point um, as I said this is a form of the Benoni uh, check Benoni and um, even though you don't see it as much as the regular modern Benoni at Grandmaster level the uh, check Benoni is more solid than um, the the modern Benoni and the reason is pretty simple is that with that pawn on e5 um, white is um, not able to um, play the um, ideas of e4 you know f4 and e5 and uh, that he usually plays in the modern Benoni with the um, attack in the center on the king side that move e5 uh, prevents that the reason why you don't see the um, check Benoni at the higher levels too much is that uh, although it's extremely solid it's just that black has little prospects and it's very passive uh, position that you have so you're solid but very passive with little chances of um, you know of counterplay in the game and um, so usually what happens is strong players just wind up grinding you down in the um, prolonged um, ending <clears throat> now I just want to uh, point out something else is that in this formation 
we see that the that Alakon was able to get into this Benoni without the insertion of the move Knight of Six, which I feel is a plus uh, in Black's case, because normally Black would wind up having to move the Knight at some point off of F6 in order to achieve the F5 advance, which is one of his plans. So for instance, um, in this game between um, Anthony Miles, Grandmaster Anthony Miles and Gary Kasparov from their match, I believe it was 1986, Miles played this uh, check Benoni. Miles had the black pieces I and mean, Kasparov was white here. Knight C3, D6, E4 and we see the locked center. And again, strategically, the play uh, will switch to the flanks. And it's important to understand your pawn structures here. The major disadvantage of black is, is the lack of space. All right, he's very solid, but white has more space. And with more space, this gives uh, white the option of choosing better uh, squares for his pieces. And better squares for your pieces and more space usually equals, equals a better position. And when you have a better position, usually you have better chances of winning, uh, winning the game. Um, with more space and more flexibility, it's easier for the side that holds the uh, space and flexibility to switch attacks easier from one point to the next. And it's hard for the cramped player to defend. So he might be able to defend for a while, but the speed which the uh, player with more space and better piece placement can move his pieces to attack in one zone or next. This eventually usually leads to some type of uh, capitulation um, by the black player in these type of positions. So let me just show you real quick what happened here in this game between Miles and um, Kasp uh, Kasparov and Miles. So <clears throat> knight f3, h3, knight bd7, and g4. And we see immediately... Again, the um, white player, Kasparov, chooses to attack on the flank, right? He could choose to attack on the king side, on the queen side, excuse me. And that's what's uh, uh, what makes these positions so rich is that some players will choose, say, as white to attack solely on the queen side and ignore the uh, king side. Some players will choose the king side and ignore the queen side. And some players will choose to play on both wings. And black has the same option. He can play on the king side or the queen side or try to play on both wings. The disadvantage, the major disadvantage is his lack of space. Uh, keeps him from being able to move quickly. And adjust to developments and changes in the position. So A6. So we see... Um, Miles opting for the traditional Benoni structure plan, a6, b5, etc., rook b8. Um, he would like his bishop to be on d7, and he would like this knight to be out of the way. But hey, that's what happens when you, you get these cramped positions. You can't get everything you want. Kasparov shuts him down with a4, right? So just making it harder to, to get that counterplay. If white can shut down the counterplay from black on the queen side, then his king side attack is gold. It will just um, run over black. So he has to, black has to um, get b5 in somehow, even if it's uh, via a pawn sacrifice. Rook b8, bishop d3. In these positions, this bishop on d3, this white light square bishop, is usually uh, just... Um, you know, just a defensive piece holding white center and doesn't have much to say uh, during the middle game um, stages of the game. This is why in um, some variations, this bishop will end up on uh, g2. 98. So there's um, ideas for black to play on the king side. It's hard for him to get his queen side push in, so he'll try to battle on the queen side. On the king side, excuse me. Another idea of this move <coughs> is basically anticipating the g5 push. Kasparov, Kasparov plays rook g1. Notice the comfort in this position where he doesn't even have to consider uh, castling because white is uh, black is so cramped in the position. 
The white king just stays on the original square. Knight c7. And now you see the the idea is not only black want, anticipating this move, but he wants to transfer this knight over here to support this advance on b5. And rook d1 and knight c7. And again, notice because of the cramped nature of the position, it is very difficult for black to... to um, you know, just get his pieces liberated. Look at the bishop on c8. You know, it's blocked by the knight here. This knight is not doing anything on d7. And it's just an uncomfortable position, although it's very solid. In other words, there's no immediate win for white here. But this is a torturous position to be in. And white just has to be patient. If you're, if you're um, you know, playing a player that likes to attack swiftly and... Is impatient. Maybe if you're playing like a, a impetuous child or something, you maybe want to adopt this as black because it can be frustrating. But if you're patient and you just wait and just make good moves, you 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 can easily end up you know in charge in these positions. Knight c7 by Miles b3 and um, Kasparov's idea is very simple. On b5, he'll let that rock. He'll let that he'll let that you know come through, and then allow uh, black to exchange, and won't do anything more than that on the queen side. Rook e8, <clears throat> and rook e8 again. This is just a symbol, a sign of black not having prospects in the position. Uh, rook e8 devalues this rook as it's behind the bishop and behind the e pawn, but. He's trying to increase the prospects for this knight to bring this knight here uh, to f8 and then eventually come out here, right? And moving this knight, of course, allows this bishop to room. So it's a lot of maneuvering, you know, that has to take place. But again, white, excuse me, black has a little bit of space. So his maneuvering is uh, quite laborious. H4. Okay, just simply sacrificing the pawn. You know, this move right here would just, um, you know, at the G5 would just be uh, devastating. Black would be forced to sacrifice the bishop on F2. Miles goes with uh, B5. And um, Kasparov could have took, um, you know, but Kasparov never really been a materialistic type player. And... He just goes for the attack. He plays g5. Miles played knight f8. And then h5 was played. And uh, white had a substantial, um, you know, uh, advantage uh, in the game. And again, it, the position is very solid. Again, like in this position, black is not lost. It's just a difficult position to play. Maybe engines can play this position for black and perhaps but I think that white uh, white just has a nice advantage in the position the counterplay is um it's kind of limited for black let's go back Kasparov did go on to win that by the way um and in this game Kasparov Kasparov had played knight f3 against miles now here's a game by Ivan Grandmaster Ivan Sokolov versus miles where he played g3 i like it a little better because the bishop is not misplaced on d3 like it was in the um other variation but it's different ideas the idea behind this is to put one of the knights here on e3 on d3 excuse me ex um instead of having that bishop sit there so in this game again miles has the black pieces and he was playing this check benoni at the time Bishop g2, knight e8, knight g e2, knight d7, castle, a6. There's the same plan that Benoni planned to expand on the queen side. a4, slowing it down, rook b8, bishop e3, b6, knight c1, knight 
Knight c7, and there's that same idea we saw in the Kasparov game with the knight coming here and this uh, push on the queen side. Knight d3. And what is what is White's idea in this position now that he's placed the bishop on g2 and the knight on d3? First of all, Fian Keto position is great defense against any type of king side attack. But the main idea is that White is determined to play on the queen side. So he puts his knight in a powerful square and he supports his break right here of b4. The two breaks in a position for White are f4 and b4. f4 is possible, of course, but the thing is you have to think of the, you know, the pros and cons of such a move. Um, if White were able to get an f4 somehow and after the exchange... There are some lines where black would be able to benefit from this uh, use of the e5 square and such. And some of his <clears throat> pieces may come alive there. If white exchanges with the pawn, the g file is open. Okay, so it's a little sharper where, you know, things, you know, sharper. Um, and gives white some more to think about there. b4 is a little more practical and natural in this position whereby either the b file will come open or white will end up with a pass pawn after subsequent exchanges <clears throat> let's look how this game continues so miles play b4 c takes remember kasparov had gam gambited the pawn um you know, he didn't even bother with this. He had just attacked on the uh, king side. But like I was saying, in these type of positions, you can play on either wing. C takes B5, A takes B5, and now a really strong move. Miles probably overlooked here, and it's the move B4. Now, no matter what happens, the, um, the pawn structure of black is going to be compromised. So, for example, if B takes A4... B takes C5, D takes C5, Knight A C4, and then let's just say C4, Knight B D2, C3, Knight takes, Rook takes B2, and then you have D6. This is all good for White. If he didn't do B, B takes C4, say he just decided to push C4. Again, having that pressure on the pawn. Takes, rook takes. And then <clears throat> the pawns are equal, but black has, excuse me, but white has um, tactical shot here. And he just plays knight takes e5. Notice the position of this knight here and this bishop. Bishop, this bishop is horrible, right? Reminds me of uh, some Sicilian defense positions. Now, the idea is just to put this pawn here. Just like that. So, knight takes. And again, after d takes, d, d takes and d6, white is just uh, better. Okay. So, now that she has some kind of understanding about the, like, check Benoni. Let's go back to the Alicon game. So, Alicon is black. And again, he's able to get this position off with without having a knight here, which is um, which is a plus because the knight usually winds up having to move. So he kind of saves he saves the tempo here. E4. And notice knight D7. Notice he doesn't play knight F6. So even at 17 years old, 16, 17 years old, he had this he had an understanding already. He was already a very strong player at this point, far away from his world championship level but very strong at this point bishop d3 a6 going for the traditional queen side um counterplay knight f3 bishop e7 castle and now alicon plays a very uh, provocative move here and plays the move g5 so he just goes for it he's determined to play uh, on the king side, even though he started out with a6, he's, he decides that he's going to play on the king side. All right. 
So this move, of course, um, being very provocative, but the only way white can really deal with it is white has to respond forcefully um, to a move like this. And with white's, um, with with white uh, being better here, he should uh, have a definite plan to counterattack white's aggressive uh, play. Here he keeps developing. He plays the move bishop e3, which is just fine. Because there is no attack. I mean, white on, black only has two pieces developed. Okay, so if anything, it's just a big weakness. Alakon plays knight f8 here. Again, now he has, no, he has just the bishop developed. So... Even though this looks aggressive, there's really nothing to it. White is just clearly uh, better at this point. All right. Now, he plays queen d2. Now, he, he connects his rooks. Um, that move is all right. You know, he connects his rooks. But, um... He had a very, very strong move here. And... Just playing the move B4 right away. Um, black black is being very aggressive, so white should try to meet that, especially being ahead in development and try to open up the position. So, for example, B4 here, C takes B4. You got Knight A4 here, but a stronger move is just Queen A4 check, Knight D7. Then queen takes b4. If knight a4, knight d7, then move like queen b3, and white still has the advantage. <clears throat> and instead of taking, say black wants to keep the position closed, and he can opt for a move like b6. But then rook b1, g4, knight d2, knight f6, f4. Again, remember with all that development, it's time to open up the, open up the position. Bishop takes f4, knight g6. Let's open up everything. And again, white has a nice position, especially at the e5. These are the type of positions where you sacrifice pawns and, and things like that. Okay? Because your your lead in development is, is temporary. So you got to do what has to be done in order to, you know, to, to show that on the board. If you play too um, calmly at times, then you'll miss the opportunity. Uh, opportunities when they arise. And this again is is very strong for um, for white. This pawn is just sitting around. It's protected now, but it's um, you know it looks very very suspect. Here Tereshenko played the move queen d2 and h6 by Alakine. and now he plays this move knight e1 again um, b4. Definitely call for, and this is uh, the theme of this video is the um, you know, squ basically squandering the advantage away by um, passive play. White, excuse me, black is played very provocatively here and, and borderline suspect, but white does not, um, you know, play aggressively enough or put enough pressure on Alicon to make him justify his position. The key feature here I see is, is Black's um, lack of space and lack of development. Where but White has the space and the development, but when the position's really close like this, the development isn't really much of a factor. Um, so White should be trying to get this position busted open somehow. Whether it be a pawn sacrifice, you know, like I mentioned before, um, you know, that, that's what, uh, white has to do to, to, um, you know, to refute black's play. As long as he lets black sit behind the 
wall of pawns and just basically set up his position and maneuver around then he'll be okay and that's why I showed you those two games from Kasparov that one from Kasparov and the one from Sokolov to show you how white kind of stifles black in the position but here you see the um, white really not taking taking charge in the position he starts playing passive so knight g6 f3 notice these are all like defensive moves these moves are all designed to kind of try to slow black down on the queen on the king side the 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 thing is is that white should be trying to uh, initiate his own play on the queen side and not really be worried about too much what black is doing again instead of f3 b4 You know, and that's just a simple variation. See, White gets his 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 uh his his um plan going full swing, and of course he ends up being better because he has a better position. Instead of B four, Rook B one is another um move with the same idea. B four. Remember, there's two breaks: it's B four and F four. But with G five played. It's real simple to see you got to go for the B4 break if you're white. You know, you can play a move like Bishop B6 here. So compare those moves to F3, which is basically basically a defensive move. And again, white is not worse here, but what it is is that the mentality of playing passive, you know, just that... Um, mentality where okay I'm better and if I just hold then I'll be okay sometime that'll backfire against you because you got to put pressure on the opponent knight f6 rook c1 which to me is dubious why why rook c1 why play a move like rook c1 are you opening up the c file is like what's going on with that the rook if anything belongs on b1 Now it kind of just continues. Bishop d7. And now we see a3. Again, this, you know, plan of b4 is in the, in the mix, but the rook belongs here. b6. So Alakine knows that, okay, there's a possibility of b4 coming. So he he's not trying to play on the queen side. He's just trying to hold... He's trying to hold white on the queen side and then fulfill, fulfill his dreams of pursuing this king side attack. King h1, another a passive move. Again, all of white's moves, you know, for the last couple of moves have been like these preparatory moves to kind of try to slow black down on the um, king side. This allowed black to equalize. Knight h5. G3. So now we see F3, G3, King H1, all of these these type of moves, and we can see that um, this allows Black to do what he wants to do. Bishop H3, and now Knight C2. He uh, he just decides to give up the exchange. You know, I guess he figured since there's no open files that the rook wasn't worth that much. Queen F2. Queen H3. So now we see Alakon building up this attack. That he never should have had. Knight E1. And now there's now here's some tactical um shots that Alakon is known for. Right? Again, he's young here. He's just coming into his style. And he gives up he gives up this piece. <clears throat> G takes F4. G takes F4. And now black is completely winning just like that. Bishop d2. And now what? The move rook g8. Right? Make sure the king is cut off. And also with this threat of hopping hopping in here. White did knight g2. And then quickly uh, lost the game after the powerful bishop h4. The idea of course if queen takes 
then queen takes h4, then there's checkmate on g2. And if knight, <clears throat> and if knight takes h4, then knight g3, exploiting the pin. Then after king g1, then knight takes f1 check. Now the queen is protecting the knight and there's a check from the rook on uh, g8. So the bishop h4, knight d1 was played, and then Alakhan just snatched up the um, queen on f2 and went on to win. If you try to move the bishop out the way, from this is queen e2, then again knight g3. Check just picking up the queen and then made after that. <clears throat> so the game went on for a few more moves, and Alakhan just built up this uh, smashing attack. And notice how at the end he just cuts off the escape, escape square f2 from the the king, and then just ideas uh, just play. Uh, the made at the end and now I just want to show you that game because um, you know passive play is um, something that I see a lot of players you know it's almost like they're afraid to do something wrong or or they feel that if they have a shot like a solid position that they just can you know kind of sit back and sometimes they try to be so provocative they let their opponents grab the initiative you know, because they figure if if uh, they play real solid that eventually the opponent is... You give the guy enough rope, he's going to hang himself. Like, you heard that before. And some players play, like, in that style. But it's a dangerous style to play because, again, a good player will, you know, latch on to the right plan. And we see here that White never attacked anywhere on the board. He never attacked on the king side or the queen side. He just... um. You know, he played a3, nothing ever came of that, and uh, he made a, a lot of defensive moves on the king side, which turned out to be weaknesses at the end. So that's the lesson for the day, is try not to play passive. Look for look for um, ways to put pressure on the opponent, you know, at all times. Um, and learn from those two games from Kasparov and Sokolov, and compare them with this game between Tereshenko and Alakon. You saw White putting a lot of pressure. Um, you saw White uh, putting a lot of pressure on um, on his opponent. You know, again, in this uh, Kasparov game, notice the difference in the position. All the pressure here that White has as opposed to what actually took place in... Um, you know, in the game that I just showed you. So anyway, please like and comment and all that stuff. And here's the, the actual game. And um, I'll see you guys on the next video.